when folks in a video game decide to worship a weird thing, that's pretty much between them and their weird thing. It's not for us to judge how weird or creepy or skin-crawlingly gross that thing is. That is, however, until we get roped into doing quests in the service of said thing or trying to prevent said thing from destroying humanity, at which point you bet we're going to have something to say about the object of all this worshipful reverence. In fact, we've got several things to say about the grossest things that people worship for some reason, and here they are. Please enjoy and beware spoilers for the following games. If you've played Final Fantasy VII, you'll be familiar with handsome, white-haired antagonist Sephiroth. Much of the intrigue in Final Fantasy VII's plot surrounds the mystery of Sephiroth's origins, specifically his relationship to Genova, a gross, fleshy monster from space that he refers to as his mother. Must have got his looks from his dad's side. You'll actually face off against Genova in battle multiple times over the course of the game, occasions where you get to see her in her full hideous glory. She looks like something you'd find growing on a student's unwashed pasta bowl and spends all of her time trying to obliterate you with a tail laser. <laughs> Sephiroth must have got his lack of a tail laser from his dad's side. The thing is, Sephiroth isn't the only one who's unhealthily obsessed with Genova. Over the course of the game, you'll meet strange figures in black robes who worship Genova and by extension Sephiroth and all seem to talk about a reunion. Should have called them Genova's Witnesses. That reunion involves the robed figures being drawn to Genova's location in order to literally become one with her. It's revealed that these worshippers were actually subjects of an experiment and were injected with cells from Genova herself, with the reunion occurring as those cells attempt to return to the whole. Unfortunately for these guys, Sephiroth doesn't fancy sharing unification with Mumsy with anyone else and murders all these poor chumps, making this the worst reunion since my 10 year high school reunion where everyone was better looking and more successful than me. That leaves Sephiroth as the sole human to merge with Genova, which probably explains why when you finally do catch up with him, he turns into his own unique brand of freakish monstrosity. Now see that, that's from his mother's side. Fine work, brave tarnished. The greater will is pleased. You have earned the right to become Elden Lord. Like a magic eye picture, the theological lore of Elden Ring is intriguing, complex, and if you focus on it for too long, you get all dizzy. At the very least, we can say that the Greater Will is a powerful godlike entity that presides over the lands between and created the Elden Ring, which is the object that powers the Erd Tree, which is the giant tree that confers the Golden Order, which is the metaphysical framework underpinning the faith of the followers of the Greater Will. Whew. 24 seconds. Yeah, that'll do it. The Greater Will is one of these gods who's too cool to hang out in the physical world telling people what to do directly, and therefore it requires messengers to spread the good word. And where a god in a more mundane cosmology might choose a prophet or a bunch of angels to get the job done, the Greater Will has chosen a terrifying giant hand with only two fingers. This religion better come with some awesome holidays, is all I'm saying. This duo of digits can't talk on account of it being fingers, and therefore to do anything more than flip someone the bird, it requires an interpreter to help it get the word out, which is where the finger readers come in. Look there, the fingers shudder with exuberance. Oh, I wish they wouldn't. It won't escape your attention as you navigate the lands between that there are more of these two fingers all over the place at the top of every divine tower. These are marginally less creepy in virtue of being long dead. 
Nor can you fail to notice that the giant fingers from which you yourself are receiving wisdom from the greater will are rotted and disgusting in a pretty undivine looking way, which raises two serious questions. One, what does this giant hand need with a chair? And two, can we really trust what a pair of huge decaying fingers are telling us? More like greater won't. Ugh. Though you are a heretic, we will pray for the salvation of your soul for as long as we live. God bless you. One of the less frequently mentioned problems with living in the post-apocalypse is how boring it is. No video games, no Netflix, and I suspect the options on Uber Eats are severely limited. It's hardly surprising then that in search of a bit of fun and community to while away the hours in the blasted nuclear wasteland, people do tend to set up a disproportionate number of bizarre religious cults. Our father, Salantius, has already started his sermon. Just enter the temple and see the light of truth. This group, hanging out in a ruined church in the middle of the River Volga in the game Metro Exodus, have two core beliefs. One, that all technology is evil and should be shunned, and two, that a giant fish will look after them. It's not entirely clear how those two things are connected. Maybe fish just hate technology. I've never asked one. Either way, this strange gang, led by Father Salantius, really do worship the creature they call the Tsarfish, wearing hats with little drawings of fish on them, talking about how the fish has the ability to purify technology, and praying to the fish for protection. I'll just have some rest here before I go back. I'll keep praying for you to the Tsarfish for the rest of my life. It might save your soul. Now, I know what you're thinking. The Tsarfish is probably a metaphorical deity who merely represents the rich bounty offered up by the rivers and seas. Wrong. It's a literal, massive fish. Yes, it turns out that the Tsarfish is a sort of heavily mutated, hyper-intelligent catfish that patrols the Volga and dwells deep in the bowels of a flooded rail terminal. Unfortunately for you, you need to venture into that rail terminal to recover a train engine. You'll spend the next half an hour or so being thoroughly menaced by this giant, disgusting fish as you attempt to negotiate this sprawling rail terminal. And because it's clever, it'll be doing its darndest to knock you into the water and turn you into fish food. Which is why it's a blessed relief when you finally secure the engine and get the hell out of the fish's house. Oh, we got it! Finally! I'm young! Are you alright? Don't think you're alive. Still only the second most unpleasant interaction I've had with a catfish. Yeah, that's right, Lisa. Or should I say Gerald? Have you ever felt like you were meant to be part of something bigger? Then maybe Unitology is for you. The devil works hard, but the Church of Unitology PR department works harder. Given that despite the incidents of violence and madness linked to Unitology's most sacred artifact, known as the Marker, the 200-year-old religion has billions of followers. One day, all mankind will be united through the power of a sacred artifact known as the Marker. In Dead Space, the Marker is an ancient alien relic that turns people into space zombies, aka necromorphs. On this much, I think we can agree. The Unitologists, however, also believe the Marker will unify all of humanity in an event they call the Convergence. As we await glorious convergence, it is important to continue to nurture our relationship with the Marker and understand the future it is preparing for us. Which, fine, each to their own vague utopian prophecy, I guess. But when a religion's recruitment materials have people's faces burning off, you have to wonder if they have the same idea of a good time as you do. Convergence is coming, and Unitology is helping it happen. Then it turns out that convergence is actually what happens when a marker is surrounded by enough necromorph biomass to trigger the next phase in the marker's game plan, which is to blast necromorphs into the stratosphere and smush them together. What the hell is it doing? What it was made to do. Isaac, you have to make us whole. This stratospheric smushing of necrotic tissue into a gross space ball begins the formation of a brethren moon. A Brethren Moon turns out to be a sentient, space-faring, tentacled zombie moon that wants to consume all life everywhere. So I guess they really don't have the same idea of a good time as me.
We are all awake now. Awake and hungry. But where is it? Take us home, Isaac. Make us whole. I can't wait to hear Unitology PR talk their way out of this one. Oh, yeah. Pale blood. <laughs> well, you've come to the right place. Yarnum is the home of blood ministration. Another From Software game, I hear you cry. Well, yes, because when it comes to giant gross things and a bunch of weirdos who worship them, FromSoft is pretty much unmatched. Bloodborne's unique variety of religious fanatics are the Healing Church, pretty much the driving force behind everything that happens in the game and the inhabitants of the huge cathedral ward area. Is it called a ward because I always end up looking like I need to be hospitalised? The Healing Church are the ones who first began distributing the old blood that sent everyone in Bloodborne City Yharnam a little loopy, but their elite delegates are known as the Choir. You'll only encounter actual members of the choir on very rare occasions in the game, and from what we can tell, they're not exactly chosen for their singing voice. And hopefully... Wow. Wow. Wow! Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Quite frankly, I bet you don't even need to be able to hold a tune. The choir differs from the rest of the Healing Church because it's specifically focused on communing with an eldritch great one known as Abriatus, Daughter of the Cosmos. But while Daughter of the Cosmos sounds like a beautiful, romanticised name, when you head down the elevator in the Upper Cathedral Ward to the aptly titled Altar of Despair and actually meet Abriatus, you'll discover that she looks like something that Cthulhu picked out of his belly button. Cthulhu does have a belly button, right? Uh, I'll check later. The ensuing fight against Abriatus is actually entirely optional, and initially she doesn't even attack you unless you aggro her first, but choose to engage with this writhing mass of tentacles and trypophobia, and it is indeed possible to destroy the object of the choir's worship. Hey, now they can really focus on the singing. I did them a favour, really. Today she's... well, she's a skeleton. An ancient corpse, but more importantly, a corpse that's been brought to this sanctuary by her keeper. Strictly speaking, the Dark Brotherhood is a professional organisation rather than a religious one. But when you have to summon the attention of said organisation by performing a grim ritual known as the Black Sacrament, it feels like we're splitting hairs. I did the Black Sacrament over and over with the body and the things. You know what? It's still better than calling someone on a telephone and speaking to them with your voice. Ugh. Creepy Death Cult is exactly the vibe you're going for, however, when you're Tamriel's premier club for goth assassins. And if the Dark Brotherhood's aesthetic aspirations didn't come across with the Black Sacrament, there's also the fact that they have historically taken most of their orders from the desiccated corpse of a woman known as the Night Mother that they keep in a coffin in their headquarters. Yeah, when I go, that's how they're going to keep running outside Xbox. It's in my will. The Night Mother is the spiritual leader of the Dark Brotherhood, though for the most part she doesn't move or speak or conduct team-building workshops on account of being a very old mummified dead body who, with the greatest respect, looks like a nightmare. If you're very lucky though and not averse to climbing into the Night Mother's coffin, you might get a few words from the boss herself. Still better than using the telephone. The cataclysm awakes the sleeping giants from ancient worlds. Crashing through the barriers of time, they invade our world to conquer, to rule the whole human race. They rise to devour us. We kneel to worship them. They never stop, only to seek others for battle for ultimate world domination. 1994 fighting game Primal Rage imagined a post-cataclysmic world where dinosaurs roamed the earth and fought each other in surprisingly formalised best of three bouts. These weren't just your average run-of-the-mill prehistoric creatures though. There was a Tyrannosaurus Rex who could breathe fire, a big blue gorilla with the abilities of Sub-Zero from Mortal Kombat, and a dinosaur crossed with a snake who could perform voodoo magic. <laughs> To be fair, that's only slightly less plausible than the stuff they've been putting in recent Jurassic Park movies. A dinosaur that can go invisible, please. With civilization well and truly blasted back to the Stone Age, each of these enormous prehistoric monsters is worshipped like a god. 
and as the arcade mode progresses, each dino amasses tens of thousands of pagan worshippers. It's clear which of these groups of fanatics have picked the short straw, though. That would be the followers of the fighter called Chaos, a giant ape whose selection of special moves involves gross bodily functions, including vomiting balls of puke around and releasing a cloud of green flatulence so potent it causes his opponent's brains to go haywire. It's like King Kong, the disgusting teenage years. And yet, in spite of the fact that he probably smells worse than Tarzan's loincloth, Chaos has more and more followers showing up to every fight as you work your way through the arcade mode, conquering the new Earth. That's not to say worshipping Chaos is without its benefits. A few lucky acolytes will be chosen to be rewarded with the ultimate honour, being eaten to help restore energy before the final boss rush. Well, that explains the flatulence. Too much red meat? Those were the seven grossest things worshipped by people for their own weird, gross reasons. I'm sorry, it's not for us to question. But um, if you're into gross things, then uh, can I interest you in this video from Outside Extra, which is about the most shocking things to happen to your hands in first person. We're really doubling down on the grossness, aren't we? So if you've got a strong stomach today, then you want to flow straight on into that video. And if you'd like to watch something else from Outside Xbox, which is us here on this channel, why not check out last week's video about the times you made a game completely unwinnable with your nonsense. You know how you are. So um, watch one of those, and we'll see you back here on Thursdays for a fresh new video. Also, subscribe, why not? And, um, oh, there's a Patreon. If you'd like to support us, you don't have to. There's a Patreon, and the details are here somewhere. Thanks for watching. See you next time. <laughs>